Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Can you introduce yourself to us? Hi, my name is Moshe Schenfeld. I'm 34 years old. Uh, I live here in Jerusalem. I'm ex-ultra-Orthodox, Jewish ultra-Orthodox. I am one of the founders and I was for a while the chairman of Out for Change, an organization that helps ex-ultra-Orthodox, and I'm an atheist myself. You're an atheist yourself? Okay, great. Yeah, and that and was a spoiler. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, yeah. um, actually, before we go into your organization and what you do and your um, activism, Out for Change, uh, which is amazing, by the way, um, can you tell us a little bit about your own personal story and what you went through, through being ultra-Orthodox to now being an atheist? So, being uh, ultra-Orthodox is um, basically being religious plus. So, first of all, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, even more than uh, in the rest of the world, is a relatively close um, uh, community. My family is, in terms of, of the community, were considered open-minded. We had a little bit of books, for instance, that were not written by uh, ultra-Orthodox people, but, for instance, no television, no movies, etc. Um, also, education-wise, uh, especially the boys in the ultra-Orthodox community, don't learn almost anything other than religious studies. So, for instance, I didn't even learn ABC. The only reason I have decent English is because of my, my mother is American. Uh, the math level I learned was just a little bit above the multiplication table. Uh, no science, no history, etc. Uh, but I was very, very good with religion studies. Uh, you won't be able to beat me in that. Yeah, I actually heard that you were... By the way, just... I forgot to mention this. We're in Jerusalem right now, and you are in touch with. Uh, you're mostly were involved in the middle of the uh, community here, like or were you somewhere else? We started the... here. Um, I I grew up no. I grew up in Petah Tikva. It's a city close to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. Um, it's a mixed city. Some there there's neighborhoods where there are uh, ultra Orthodox, but not all of the city. Uh, when I grew up, I studied here for four years in uh, Hebron Yeshiva. It's here in. Uh, Jerusalem is like considered one of the most prestigious yeshivas and you're 16 years old you you leave home you sleep in uh, dorms for like three weeks at a time and just go home for weekends once in a while so saying apparently saying that you were good is a huge under like under under representation of what how good you were because apparently what, what uh, Amir told me is that you becoming an atheist uh, and leaving that community was a huge lost to them because you were like were you like famous in that community? I was not I, I wasn't famous that's too much to say because when you are just a young guy you're never famous but I mean I was a serious uh, uh, boy I, I, I studied um, um, people knew me in yeshiva for instance which is in a thousand people place it's a, it's a thousand people study there uh, in one big room, by the way, which is an amazing uh, site. I didn't grow up Hasidic. I grew up in a different sect of the Ultra Orthodox. I was Litvish. And I have one of my cousins is uh, Hasidic, and she married a, a Hasidic guy, and I met him right after the wedding. And he asked me, where did I study? I told him, Hebron Yeshiva. And he told me, oh, I know someone from there. And I was surprised, like, there are barely any Hasidic people in that Yeshiva. And I asked him, who do you know? And he gave me the name, and I was like, I didn't expect that. Um, so he said, yeah, he's a good friend of mine, and he called him, and uh, I asked that guy, you know, like, why, why, why do you know him? And he said, oh, I, I didn't tell you, but after you left, I was sort of shocked, traumatized by the fact that, you know, someone that I appreciated, admired, left, and I went to study and learn, and, and I looked for answers. And he met some guy that was Hasidic from that specific sect of Hasidics, and, and he was very convinced by him. So maybe, you know, I made it even, you know, I left, he became even stronger religious, so I don't know, maybe God is okay with me. <laughs> Wait, so how did you become an atheist? So, I grew up in a family which is not, uh, it's, it's relatively unique in, in the ultra orthodox community, where we were encouraged to ask questions, mm -hmm. um, because we were sure there were answers, and in, in a sense it came from a point of, of having a lot of pride and saying like, you know, most people can't ask questions, they might get mixed up, but, but we, the, mm -hmm. the Schenfeld, you know, we can deal with it. So, you know, you should ask and you should know the answers because there are answers. So I was always interested in, in, in the questions and I always read the books of the rabbis who are convincing the, the non-Jewish or non-Orthodox non uh, Jews to, uh, to, to convert, to, to realize that Judaism is the right religion and ultra-Orthodox is the right uh, 
part of it. And at the age of, of 18, 19, I realized that, you know, hearing the other side's point of view from the, your people's point of view is not really fair. You know, you got to give them a fair chance to... Um, so I went to the, uh, in, in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which is like 30 minutes walk from my yeshiva, there is the National Library. And someone told me that every book that was written in, in Israel has to have two copies there. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. I got to see the place. Mm-hmm. I wanted to read just a few books that I was interested. I read a little bit about science. I, I was a curious person. And I got there and I realized, oh, it's a chance to study about a few more subjects. And uh, part of it had to do with, with um, the proofs I knew about that religion is correct. And it turned out that it was not really correct. Um, do you remember some books, some of the books? So, so most of them had to do with uh, something called Torah Tehudot. I'm not sure exactly what's the, how does it translate. It's the whole subject of how the Torah, the Bible, was edited along the years. Uh, I, I, I read a few of the classical, it's Kasuto and Kaufman and um, Torah um, how do you call him? And, ah, now I don't remember the name of the third one, Wilhoisen. He was the famous one, Wilhausen or Wilhoisen, he's a German. He's okay. the, almost the first one who came up with this uh, idea of the Bible edited from four main sources, etc. D-E, like... You're right, right, the Torminism, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's in Hebrew, it's Aleph, Dalet, uh, you oh, know, yeah, okay. yeah, but... Um, and, and I remember reading the books there and it felt like they're not arguing with the rabbis because the rabbi said <laughs> it's impossible that there was any edits uh, because na 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 we have the claims, it was continuous tradition, etc, etc. Right. And they didn't say, oh, the, the, the tradition was not continuous. Here I can, have, I can disprove your claim. Right. They were dealing with the details, like everyone is already convinced that the tradition is not continuous. I don't know who convinced them. And now they're having arguments about whether uh, uh, this book was written in, in, in this part of the, of the century or that part of the century by, under this king or that king. I was like, wait, but, but they had proofs. What about it? So, so you were surprised that they were like, that they were, that they were talking they as were if passed. it was already convinced, like this, we are way past. Yeah, th- this, this <laughs> debate was already finished. And right. I was like, we're, we're so what I did was starting reading the Bible again with fresh eyes. And, and when, when people ask me what is the one book that someone should read and become atheist, I always say the Bible. Oh, right. You need to read it with fresh eyes. I read the same verses I read but as what's, a... What's the book? But then they would ask you what's the book that would give them the fresh eyes. So there was one uh, book I read. I'm sure it's in English, but I don't remember the... the the translation, it's called, but I can look it up, it's uh, called Mika uh, Taveta Tanakh. Um, and it's a book that is sort of a short intro to the concept of, of, the, of the editing of the Bible. And just saying, like, look, these are the main claims, this is what people say, these are the hints you can find. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's like a basic intro, like a, a half an hour, an hour of discussion, you can already get it. The whole idea is just reading once you know what to look for. So, for instance, um, you know that the idea of the name of God being presented sometimes as God, Elohim, and sometimes as Jehovah, and you just look for it, and all of a sudden you see weird signs. And <laughs> it's, it's not like, you know, you just, someone tells you, look for this hint, and then see what happens. I, I don't want to tell people, look, this is all the proofs I have. That wouldn't work, because then I prove it to someone, and then he either agrees or, or doesn't agree. But if I tell him, look, these are the hints, these are the ideas, now look for yourself. See what you come up with. That's more powerful also because you convince yourself and that's what happened to me. And like I have a specific part when you comes to uh, Judges, the uh, second uh, uh, chapter, it's, it's verses 8 to 23, I remember that. And it starts with, and then, um, uh, how do you call him, uh, Joshua died and all the generation that left Egypt died with him and a new generation uh, came that didn't know God and what he did in Egypt. That's how, that's a sentence there. And I'm like, wait, but everyone told me there is a continuous tradition. And that's what the books tell. Right. Now, I'm not saying this sentence by itself proves everything's wrong. You can have interpretations to it. But it's not like when I read it, 
And when I heard about it, people said, look, generally there was a continuous uh, tradition. There are a few verses that seem that it's that, like they're contradicting it here, for instance. This is an example, but we have our interpretation that says it's not a contradiction. No, they, they just didn't mention it. Mm. So I was like, it's like, I always say my feeling was, in a sense, if you, if you um, um, perform by coincidence some scientific experiment at home, and you all of a sudden realize that gravity actually doesn't work. And so what happens is not just, okay, you might stop believing in gravity. You will say, wait, most things that I know about science are not things I check myself. I believe the scientific community. I believe the scientific system because the system proved itself, right? I drove a car. I used the elevator. I had, you know, I, I boarded an airplane, etc. Everything works because science works. Once you realize science doesn't work, well, then who knows how deep the rabbit hole goes? You know, maybe everything's a lie. You know, then you become a conspirator. Now, fortunately to me, I didn't find that anything is wrong with science, <laughs> but I did find some things wrong with religion. So if I can't trust my rabbis on one thing, right. I might not be able to trust them on anything. So in a sense, I became a conspirator of, of religion because I couldn't trust the system, my system. So do you re remember two moments, the moments that you realize that you're an atheist and also the moment that you announced that, that you're an atheist and what was the reaction to that? So the, 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 the moment I, I read this verse was not the moment I realized I'm atheist, it was the moment I realized that my journey to study this subject might not lead me to just being a religious person knowing more about his belief, but actually changing his mind. I didn't expect to change my mind from this. I just thought I need to have a stronger uh, uh, background. I need to have a, a wider view in order to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. I didn't expect to change my mind. Right. And that point where I realized, oh boy, things m might end up differently. It was like, I remember going to sleep that night. It was very weird, like, because I didn't look forward to leave ultra orthodox community. I wasn't afraid of it. I was it's like, I didn't expect it happening. And all of a sudden you realize, oh boy, you know, like you're actually, I don't know, something you, something very, you wake up one morning and you realize you, you, you were wrong. You're actually a woman. Not you feel trapped in a body of a, no, you were all the time a woman and you just never noticed. <laughs> okay, what's happening now? Yeah. But that was, it's like your, whole, like your entire understanding of the universe and the world was completely so, wrong. Right, there's one thing that I think I'm lucky in, it's the fact that none of my axioms change. Right. Because most religious people, the fact, they have an axiom that makes them religious. Either the axiom that God exists, or the axiom that their rabbi is correct, right. or the axiom that, you know, there must be something spiritual. It's, it's by itself an axiom. By me, the axiom was always, right. you should trust your logic, because that's, what, that's how my parents brought me up. The conclusion changed. Now, it was a huge conclusion, and it changed everything, but my axioms remained, and I think that's part of what helped me remain relatively, you know, stable. It, mm. it wasn't, it was very surprising, but it was not necessarily shocking. It, like, I could mm. comprehend. It's just like a huge surprise about reality, right. but it didn't change what I am, in a sense. The, the example I give, like, is it meant to people that were never religious or never believed in God is, Imagine if one day you were convinced that the flat earthers are actually right and the whole world was lying to you. Like how surprised would be exactly, that? exactly. So that's what we went through. Or, or, or maybe what happened to flat earthers when they realize or whatever you'll call yeah. that, that I think it's even maybe more similar because of the, you trust science. Part, like you didn't right. see with your own eyes the earth round. You, you right. saw a picture, you whatever, but, but you believe the system. You say, I know the system. I, it was proven correct in so many ways. I don't need to go physically to space and see it in order to believe this part. Right. And once you realize the system is false, I don't know. Anything can happen. You know, I don't know who did 9-11. I don't know who, who, what's the moon landing. Like every, that's why most conspirators don't have a conspiracy about one subject. Yeah. If you don't trust the system, you don't trust it for anything. Yeah. Why trust it about, you know, the but moon it, landing? But it's a good thing that the foundation for the, your change of view was logic. So that you won't, like, once you lose trust in one community, you, you wouldn't all of a sudden be all over the place. Right. right. Because I, ha I had the system that I grew up into was incorrect, right. but the system I was thinking with was still correct. So what about the moment that you announced it, the moment that you told everybody that you're, you're did you tell them you're an atheist? 
I, so actually what happened is I came to my parents and I told them, mom, dad, I don't believe anymore. Um, what would you ask, expect me to do? Like I didn't tell them I want to leave the community. I was like, what would you do at this point? Right. Uh, they were obviously quite shocked. It's not, it's not like, you know, I, I, there was never trouble with me, you know, as a good student. I was studying all the time. I enjoyed studying. I, I mean, I enjoy studying today. It's just then I studied Torah. But so like I, I never caused any trouble. So they were like relatively shocked. Um, but my father passed away about uh, a little more than a year ago. And he, a few months ago, I was in the first um, uh, memorial, how was it called, ceremony. And one of my aunts told me that years ago, she visited our house and she saw in the bathroom a book uh, that was also not like very, we have always had uh, in the bathroom books, like every, everywhere you read, uh, but a book which was not like very religious. And she asked him, you know, aren't you afraid that there is this kind of book, you know, where children, ultra-Orthodox children grow up. So a book that... That was like, not, you know, atheist or something, but was not like really part of the community. And she was like, why is this book r r around rolling around children? and children, yeah, they can read, you know, you, you, aren't you afraid that they will read it? Do you know what the book was? I don't know, like, she don't, doesn't remember. She told me, I'm like, it's, it's yeah. from like 25, right, right. 30 years ago, whatever. And he told her, I want my children to choose their belief. I don't want them to be enforced in them. And, and she asked me, we're two children in the family, both of us left. Both so, of Yeah. So she told me, like, like two, three years ago, she asked him, uh, she brought it up, and she told him, what do you think now about that? And he told her, my opinion didn't change. That's still my hope. I don't want them to do it just because they were told. I oh. hope that one day they'll reach the, the real truth and, and they'll know religion is correct. But right now they're doing what they believe in and, and, and that's the right thing to do. That's great. Um, yeah, so in that sense, my, like my mother was even more accepting me than my father, but my mother doesn't care that much about God as much as my father. By my, by my mother, family versus God, family wins right away. She, yeah. she was brought up American, it's different. My father really heard it, was hurt by, by what happened, but, but still, you know, we went with our, tr with our truth, that, what, that's what matters. So, Essential, you loved and accepted you. Yeah, it was very hard. We had sometimes harsh arguments, whatever, but, but like, if I would tell him I'm just a, a few steps less religious, but I'm not doing it because that's what my belief, but because I just don't feel like it, it will probably way, be way harder for him uh -huh. than accepting the fact that just, I don't believe because I'm going with my truth. It happens to me, my truth is different than him. Right. He, he was able to accept it. And so that's why, I think that's part of also why it was easier for me to do it because I grew up in a family that was sort of preparing to this option in a way. Um, the rest of my friends just didn't know what's going on. And, and it was like, I remember there was a, a meeting from my friends from like, it's not high school, it's Yeshiva Ktana, it's like, a, it's, it's sort of the equivalent to high school in the ages of, of ultra-Orthodox. And we met like, after, uh, like about 10 years after we left, uh, we, we graduated. And I was then, I think I just finished the army, was about to start pre-academic program, uh, where I had to, you know, cover whatever I missed during the years of school. Um, because you didn't study anything? No, I'd say like, no uh, ABC. Right. My English is only from uh, my mother. Uh, math was to the level of a little bit more than the multiplication table. No science, and no this history. this is for all men in the ultra yeah. community? Yeah. Only women, mo yeah. women learn other things, can learn like science and math. And right, everything. not too much, but more than men. It's, it's, it's something very funny. What happens is chauvinism helps women here because you have to go to study something. This is the law and women are not allowed to study Torah. Right. That's the, so, like, it, 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 it says in the, in the Gemara, that, the Talmud, that uh, a Torah should be bur burned before it's given to women to study. Whoa. So, so chauvinism is helping them because they have to study and they're not allowed to study Torah, so they study something meaningful. So men yet to have to study uh, only like religion. Uh, women get to study more, like 
even some of them become engineers and learn, you know. So men are, women are more educated than men. Right. Uh, in Orthodox, a lot of people, uh, this is mind blowing to them because religious religion means men get to be above women. So in, in very religious communities, women being more educated than men is not something that most people could you know relate to. But this is not really pro woman. This is empowering women in a sexist kind of way, in an anti woman kind of way, because women are being educated so that they could serve men. Well, men do next to nothing other than just reading their, their favorite text, and women basically are working and bringing in money to the family. And, and while they're working outside, they're also, they also have to do the housework as well. So they're doing both working outside, working inside, and men are just sitting around and reading religious texts. Right, <laughs> um, but, and the main but is that I don't know what happens in other um, uh, uh, patriarch um, um, communities, but it's not like men are getting such a good deal either. Mm. It's a very empty life. So like one side is slaving, and the other side, other than very few men which actually enjoy studying all the time, right. they feel like empty. meaningless. Mm. Um, I, I, like, I didn't realize it because I really enjoyed studying. For me, my life was really meaningful. Right. But like, I remember about less than a year ago, I, uh, I work today in Mobileye. Um, I'm a team manager in the algorithm department. And my team inherited uh, uh, some new technology from a different team. Uh, and there was a demo, like an autonomous vehicle demo in, in, uh, in California to the uh, managers of Intel, which bought, uh, purchased uh, uh, Mobileye. And to the demo, we needed to work something you know, to improve that technology, which we just received. And I was like, it was about a month, which I worked like five days a week. 12 hours a day, left work like 11, 12 o'clock sometimes, like we really crazy. Um, and I remember the worst night was I was leaving 1.30 1 in the morning, um, at night, whatever, I don't know. Um, and I'm like beat dead and I'm driving here to my uh, apartment and I'm driving next to a yeshiva of a, of a Hasidic sect called Bez. And their rabbi had his granddaughter marrying or something. So there were two people hanging uh, some, you know, lights or whatever from the uh, poles. And there were like about 50 guys standing outside, like young guys, like 17, 18 years old, watching. They were bored. It was exciting, you know, people hanging stuff and whatever. So they were standing and watching. And I remember feeling like if you did anything meaningful which required your energy during the day, you wouldn't stay awake 1.30 at night just to see someone hanging lights. <laughs> if you were planning to do anything meaningful tomorrow, right. you wouldn't stay up what? late. Right. How empty your life should be. Uh -uh. So someone hang hanging lights in the middle of the night is more interesting than just, I don't know, going to study. Right. I'm not saying all of them are that kind, but... Yeah. It's, 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 it's really a, a, um, it's a system where everyone loses just in different ways. Right. So it's not always the case where, because a lot of people come in to us and say, well, religion gives people meaning and atheists don't have meaning in their life. But do you have examples of like... So, so I think even, okay, we, we need to separate between just the general concept of religion where community probably helps people and believing there is some purpose to life maybe help some people, but the actual practicing, once it becomes a system that enforces you to live in a certain way, that definitely kills so many aspects of you. Right. Well, I mean, I, ju I just have to add something um, here. I mean, religion does provide community, but it comes with a lot of baggage. We right. Can, we can get that community in better ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not saying that's the best model of right. community you have. Right. Um, uh, so, so how did you... So I'm gonna, this is actually a good segue to talking about your, your organization that you founded. But you came out of this and you have little skills to function in a society, right? Right. Uh, to be able to get a job. Uh, so how did you manage? And I mean, after you tell, tell me that, like, then you started an organization that helps people coming out of these uh, communities and they all, uh, also don't have the necessary skill to function in society. So you create an organization that helps them 
Um, so can you give me both of those? So, okay, so, so basically, um, again, I have English, my mother is American, my parents didn't kick me out of the house once I told them I stopped believing. Um, I probably have a, a good analytic mind, so I managed to deal with the math. And yet, without wasting any moment after I left, and once, the, once I left, I was just about you know, going to the army, serving the three years I have to serve like any Israeli, which I studied when I was 21 years old, instead of 18 years old, like all Israelis, and then uh, the pre-academic program, and then the first degree. So I managed to uh, achieve my first degree, my bachelor degree, when I was 29 years old. And that was like the lucky guy. I'm, I mean, I really consider myself lucky relative to most people who left ultra-Orthodox community because I sort of had a background supporting me as much as you can expect. Uh, and yet I had to deal, I remember the, when I was uh, at the end of the army, like when I was 24 years old, and I had to start preparing to the SATs, the Israeli SATs, it's called psychometry. And I remember starting to read the uh, preparation, the math preparation section. And I, I'm dropping the book after like 50 minutes of reading and looking out to find a friend to ask if a minus divided by a minus is plus or minus. Because I did know that minus multiplied by minus is plus. Because it's also, it's like a, it's a coin, it, uh, it's a phrase. You know, like, oh, two minuses make a plus or something like that. Like, so I knew when you multiply a, a, a negative number by a negative number, it's a positive number. But if you're dividing, I just had no idea. I, like, which also means, not necessarily I didn't have this notion, it also means I didn't really understand what divi division is. Because right. like, I didn't see why it has to do, why, what it has to do with multiplication. Right. And, and I was curious about math. You won't say, like, I, 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 like, I played with math when I was a child. I, I, I even came up with a proof to a Pythagoras uh, theorem myself when, when I was in yeshiva. Because I was playing with whatever I knew, so and I came up with stuff. But, but I, I was lacking very basic knowledge. Right. Um, so I had to go to a, a, a preparation uh, a program, which is one year before university, uh, to study some of the subject. Also, I studied the last year in, in yeshiva, where I knew I was about to leave. I also studied some of it. So altogether, I managed to cover it. Um, so the three years of the army. The army, on one hand, is harder. But on the other hand, it's... Uh, it's a chance because everyone is a bit in shock in the army. So Orthodox women don't have even to uh, uh, to, to register to the army. What's the word? To serve in the army. Yeah. Um, it, it, when it comes to men, so the Orthodox men do go to the army. The ultra Orthodox don't go to the army. Right. Um, they don't get dismissed. They just get an extension. So as long as they're studying in yeshiva, they don't need to go to the army. Right. The, what usually happens is they keep studying in yeshiva and then it's called kolil once they're married until they're too old and then they're not supposed to serve. So basically they never serve in the army, but they never get, you know, a pass. They just get it delayed every half a year or a year. Mm -hmm. So since I left, I had to serve. I left when I was 20. So that was an advantage for you uh, the, because, I, because you got some skills at least from the army. No, the, serving in the army, definitely, it was, I think, more than the skills that I got, and I did get, I was a commander, so I had, you know, right. some management skills, and sort of, it, it was more just, it's, it's a shot of Israel society into your veins, because right. it's very easy to leave and then, you know, find like a, you know, job is, you know, I don't know, uh, being a guard in a, in a, in a you know, store or so whatever. How, sorry, I, 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 okay. because we're going to run out of time, but how did the other people have a disadvantage? So, b what I realized <coughs> is, is me getting to, a, 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 um, graduating my degree at 29 years old, after having almost all of the advantages that I could expect leaving the ultra Orthodox community, I wasn't kicked out of my house. I, I, I mean, I literally, a lot of uh, uh, the uh, people who leave are, in the best case, the, the, the family will acknowledge them, but just won't let them live, stay live in the family because they don't right, behave. Right, right, right. And some of them even just completely disconnect with them. Um, I had English basic English because it was not I didn't study in so school it's a but huge disadvantage like for them what, what is so the, for, think about it um, basically the deal ch people have with society is look till the age of 18 we will take care of you mm. we will make sure you get uh, education free education if you're you don't have parents or your parents are problematic we might even take you out of the house society 
is responsible for a child getting a set of skills to the age of, age of 18, and then you're 18, you're on your own. If, if, if a child didn't learn how to talk or how to count, you wouldn't tell him, oh, you're 18, you're on your own, you're good, you're a grown man. It doesn't help him to be a grown man if he doesn't know how to talk or how to read or how to, or how to count. Um, and here what happens is you didn't get this deal. Oh, shit. And so if you stay in the community, you don't need much of the skills you didn't get because you know to study and you'll study. Good for you. And also during the last 15, 20 years, the government is providing a lot of support to Orthodox people, ultra-Orthodox, that want to... Uh, okay. First of all, they're giving a ton of money to Orthodox for remaining Orthodox, but that's because the Orthodox um, parties are almost always part of the coalition and they... They're very focused. They say, look, I don't care. You can be left-wing, right-wing. You can be capitalist, socialist. We don't care. We Let us do what we want with our community. Support us so and do whatever you want. So, so instead of funding these people that are leaving, the, old, the religious communities are actually get the funding instead. Yeah. They get the funding for the yeshivas and all of that. But even funnier than that, the government, not because the ultra-Orthodox parties asked for it, but because the government realized it's important, started funding ultra-Orthodox starting to work. Because they realized we can't fight them, they're too strong, but let's at, let's, let's at least help someone that is ultra-Orthodox and does want to work, okay. help him you know, study, help him get some proper education. So they opened a lot of programs for ultra-Orthodox that want to start working and, okay. and taking part in Israeli society. But if you're not ultra-Orthodox anymore, you didn't get it because the programs were for ultra-Orthodox oh. that want to work. Oh, so no. we really, you know, fell between the cracks. Oh, we didn't get proper education as young people because we were ultra-Orthodox. We don't get now the support because we're not ultra-Orthodox anymore. <laughs> oh, so everyone just forgot about us. <laughs> oh, no. So it, it, it didn't make sense. I, uh, th that's basically why we. And this is where this comes from. Yeah. So the, you guys fell in the gaps, and this company that you started, Out for Change, is trying to support exactly the people that you just talked about. Exactly. That didn't get any support because because they were ultra orthodox before, and now they're not getting any support because, because they're, they're not, not ultra orthodox. <laughs> and they say, "Look, you're a grown man. You can take care of yourself." You know, I, 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 some secular people say, "Well, I don't have any organization helping me," and I'm like. Yeah, because you got ABC in school. Why yeah, someone yeah. needs to help you? You don't need a right. reading uh, group. Okay. But so, so originally we were a bit naive. We thought just, you know, government agencies did, just didn't think about it. They didn't realize, you know, because also 10, 15 years ago, there were not that many people leaving the old Orthodox community. So we thought they just didn't realize this is a... So let's just go tell them. them we'll take yeah, care so of. we'll meet, you know, uh, 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 Knesset members and uh, parliament members and... and, and uh, uh, decision makers, right. let them realize they missed this group and everything will be okay. Then we realize that it's a bit more difficult. Uh. Part of it is because there were no knowledge even about it because they didn't realize it's a phenomenon so there was no research done about the subject so they asked us things like how many people leave the elder Orthodox community and we didn't have answers. There was no research done about it. Do you have answers now? So we have a research which we did and afterwards was authorized by the uh, Central Bureau of Statistics done based on their information which uh, says that approximately 10% of young people that grow up in the ultra orthodox community leave it oh, which great. is a lot and it's growing all the time wow. this data is up to date for 20 12 or 2013, meaning so it could be much probably more. much more than that. Wow, that's like um, yeah, social media. And so, so when, yeah, internet did a big part of the job, no doubt about it, and then even the smartphone did a lot more because right. if you need a computer, a computer is not something you can hide. A smartphone, right. anyone can hide. Uh, it made a huge difference, no doubt about that. Right. Also, the fact that there are more people who did it, so first of all, it's not that weird. I mean, you're not the first one coming up with this crazy idea. You know someone did it. Also, someone can support you. You know, you can sleep for the first week on the couch of your cousin or your friend from yeshiva who, who, who left a year before, two years before. Right. So be, because we're going to run out of time, can you tell so, us what this organization does? So we started focusing on policy changing. We started focusing on fighting for the rights of ex-ultra-Orthodox, that any support provided to the ultra-Orthodox 
for, for, for work and, and, and education, etc., will be provided to anyone that was educated as an ultra-Orthodox and not to anyone who is currently ultra-Orthodox. As we said, you know, the fact that I took off my yarmulke doesn't mean all of the math came in instead. <laughs> like, someone needs to put it in there. Right. Um, that was originally. Then once we started convincing policymakers, we realized when they tried to open programs, they have no idea how to do it because they only opened programs that were isolated for the community of ultra-Orthodox. Mm -hmm. But supporting someone who's ex-ultra-Orthodox that comes to study in a normal university, they didn't know how to do it. So you started working with them there. Today, I think like seven or eight uh, colleges and universities who have program for anyone who came from the ultra-Orthodox community and wants to study together with everyone else. And we supported them in, in planning these programs. And about two years ago, we even extended it to supporting directly people. So we were like about four years, we were just working with agencies and, and governments and, and the government and, and, and the army, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but not directly with the people. The people enjoyed the benefits just because the program opened. They were eligible for scholarships that before they were not getting, etc. And then we realized that you also need to provide some community sense. Because mm -hmm. other than the technical stuff, for a lot of people, it's, uh, it's emotionally, it's very hard. They don't know mm. the codes, they don't know the language sometimes, not the language literally, most of them speak Hebrew, but you know, the terminology. You don't, you know, people don't realize how much they're, they share with, for instance, Western people share so much about, you know, they can have a joke about friends or about Seinfeld or about things like that. Like everyone knows what it is. You know, yeah. there's a certain If you don't phrases, know these little things, you don't feel like you're part of the society. You don't feel like you're part, and even worse, I think, People see it, and you're weird, and they don't know why you're weird. Mm. So they just expect you're a weirdo. You know, you, you behave weird, you don't look in the eyes, you don't, whatever. And it can be for a lot of things. This person didn't speak with women for like his entire 18 years because he was educated that it's, it's, it's not okay, you know, only with his mother. And, and then he comes and he's, I don't know, interviewed by a woman, and he just doesn't feel comfortable. Right. And he's not crazy, he's not anything, but, but he looks like he's a weirdo. So. Right. So, so I just want to say, this is, you, you guys are doing amazing work. So you. if you guys want to support this, is, uh, just search for Ad for Change, and the URL is, what is this? www.leshinui.org. It's Leshinui. It's Yotzim Leshinui is the Hebrew word for Out for Change. So it's Leshinui. Uh, but if you'll search Out for Change, you'll find us as well. So other than and this, um, Tell me anything else you want to, I have more questions about other things, but tell me anything else you want to add about this program before I go So, there. So one of the interesting things, and I also encourage people to, to read a little bit about media uh, reports done about uh, the subject of ex ultra orthodox both in Israel. Um, we were trying, part of what we wanted to do is to change the image of ultra ex ultra orthodox in the eyes of the society, because what, what happened was people barely spoke about it, and when they spoke it was just, you know, this, this, um, uh, a cliche um, an article about oh they're so sad and it's so hard and etc and not about the potential because think about it it's like a huge number of people starving to do something meaningful in life and coming out of a place they didn't know anything and you don't need to uh, invest so much in them in order to get so much benefit. The ROI, the return on investment here is amazing. And we wanted to show it and we wanted to wake everyone up. So what we did is we organized a lawsuit of 50 ex ultra orthodox who sued the government. We couldn't sue as an organization, but they sued as private people, sued the government for not providing them what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to give them basic education that's required by law. Oh, wow. And they sued them for it. Um, and for, for not giving them the education and for um, refusing to help them cover what they missed later on in life. Go. So, we, 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 first of all, what we wanted to achieve is to wake everyone up and get uh, and pressurize the, the government. We got that 100%. Technically, the, the lawsuit, what happened was the, the, uh, what the country did, the, the, the government did, they, they had three claims. One, they said, nah, it's okay, you didn't miss anything, mm. but they barely said anything about it. And two, they tried to focus on two technicalities. One, they filed a third-party lawsuit against all the parents in all the schools, because, which is, by the way, crazy, because you can't sue a parent for sending a child to a school that was authorized by the government. <laughs> the only, and the, the judge was furious about it. The only reason they did it is to put pressure on the children because the parents told the children, I don't want to be in danger 
And and anyway, Wait, the, so the, the Israeli government here tried to try to emotionally sabotage the kids by saying, "Drop this, or we'll come, or we'll come after your parents." Exactly. What the hell? Well, okay. <laughs> uh, some children dropped it because of that. Most of them realized that it's nonsense. Like the judge even told the the. the the government, like, leave it aside. Other than this, you also do some atheist activism, other than your involvement with this organization. I, I wouldn't dare call it activism, but uh, I did do, I did act a few times. Um, I had, I think, my, my most important uh, um, contribution was uh, two lectures I gave, which were filmed and uh, are available on YouTube. I don't think they have uh, um, subtitles. And one of them has like 30,000 views, which in Israel is a lot for a more than longer than hour lecture. Right. I had tens or even hundreds of people communicate me along the years. Like, right. for instance, in Facebook, someone sends me... Is, a, is it mostly about why Judaism is... Uh, is right? it, it's not even about why Judaism is wrong. It's a introduction to, to the subject of how do you deal with the most major claim about the continuous tradition. Mm -hmm. And I really tried to present it only as an introduction. I obviously, I presented the counterclaims so people can see why it's problematic, but I didn't really say, okay, they're wrong because ABC. Mm -hmm. And like tons of people approached me and told me that was like a key factor for them in leaving the community because they were convinced by this. And uh, why, do you, why do you do that as well? Um, first of all, we spoke before and you said something that I absolutely agree with. Um, um, anything you do that is helping people reach a correct conclusion is a positive thing. Anything you do that makes people have a mistake is negative. So by definition, I think it's true. Um, I also feel like in a sense, I don't know if it's logical, but in a sense, I wasted so many years of my life uh, learning about things that I'm not going to use anymore. So in a sense, at least the things that I learned while I was leaving, I would want that to be able to, to, to be helpful to people. Because, you know, what I learned as a yeshiva boy, I don't see how I can do it, I can use it other than, you know, have some coin phrases, you know, things like that, whatever. But, uh, but, but what I learned as I was leaving can be helpful to people, and I saw it's helpful to people. And I remember how, how upset I was that there are so many rabbis working, and by the way, getting money, for convincing people that Judaism is right, and there's barely anyone working. Mm. And the other thing, because atheists, their belief is not, you know, you should pull everyone out, unlike um, um, uh, religious people, which really believe, you know, they're getting a lot of money in the sky right. when they will die for getting more and more to souls, you know, saved. So obviously they have the interest. So there was like, it's not balanced. So I said, you know, do whatever you can. And what's your um, rough, I, I know you're not going to have an exact uh, number for this, but do you have any rough estimates for how many of the people that leave the ultra-Orthodox community uh, left either because they are stop believing or, or and plus the number of the people that eventually stop believing like in total the what's the when people leave this community how many of them what percentage of them are eventually become atheists so um why do they leave so there is a re one of the things we did in the organization was uh have a research done by dr neri horvitz which interviewed over 100 ex-ultra-Orthodox and people working with them. And one of the things he did was try to figure out why do people leave. Uh, he estimated that about 10 to 15 people start the process because... 10 to 50 percent. Sorry, yeah. 10 to 15 percent of the people um, start the process for reasons that have to do with belief, belief in, in, in their, uh, uh, what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a lot of the, the rest of the people that start sometimes from, for reasons as, you know, they want to be uh, self-fulfillment fulfillment, or feeling like completely disconnected from the community or sometimes they had, you know, all sorts of th bad things that happened to them in the community, etc. Like traumas, you know, uh, uh, it can be, for instance, a side note, right. uh, uh, being a homosexual yeah. and the ultra orthodox might be also traumatic. So, um, total. So, so, so a lot of them also afterwards think about, you know, 
then they start asking questions and change their mind. A different research which we done, which I mentioned before, where we checked how many people left the ultra-Orthodox community based on the uh, Central Bureau of Statistics um, data. So it says that 40 to 50% of people who leave define themselves as secular or traditional. Now, in Israel, traditional and secular doesn't exactly say what you believe in. Right. Because traditional means you practice some of the things. A lot of atheists even might have, you know, uh, Christmas uh, right. dinners. Right. So it's hard to say what's happening exactly. Say. How strong do you think is the atheist uh, activism community here, like the atheist activist community, not just the atheist? And do you think there's a, a point to connect the atheist activists in Israel with the global atheist activ activist community? So, first of all, in Israel, it's, it's harder to isolate atheism from uh, working against or, or dealing with um, uh, religion. Because unlike in the, in the States, for instance, where religion is not extremely affecting the everyday life, so you have specific arguments, for instance, with abortion and things like that, where religion is playing a key role. But it's not like people won't consider it one of the biggest issues in the United States. Here in Israel, the ultra orthodox community being more than 10% of people and barely working and, and not going to the army, etc., uh, is, 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 is a very strong effect on, on everyday life. It's one of the biggest issues. Hmm. So it's very hard usually to distinguish between atheism and just dealing with the ultra orthodox community and people leaving from it. It, it sometimes it combines, sometimes it separates because right. not everyone leaving the ultra orthodox community is becoming secular. So, so it's, it's hard to, to do this uh, distinction. Um, I do think, just by the sheer fact that, that, that Judaism is the root of basically all Western religions, um, leaving that religion is, in a sense, I don't know, more meaningful. But it, it, it carries a different sense and different burden and a different opportunity. Awesome. Um, you know, you're plucking a leaf out of the root, not out of the, you know, one of the branches. <laughs> right. It's, it's different. Um, so you're saying that atheist activism here has a more could have more of a global consequence because it came all it came all from here, so maybe it could end so, all here. So <laughs> yeah, I, look. First of all, if there's gonna be uh, uh, if, if if there's gonna be an atheist convention here in Jerusalem, right. I, I'm sure it's gonna be like there's probably the Vatican, Mecca, and here are probably the the three cities that will be most influential in that sense. And in a way, because we're the first. So, you know, maybe it's more important. Um, I think maybe, I don't know, I think like religion, the, the Jewish religion, because for 2,000 years Jews were not so powerful anywhere they lived, it, it, it turned to a different version of, of religion than most other religions. Like Islam and, and Christianity had religion and the nation sort of combined in a lot of ways during most of the years. It, it, the, 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 the church or was, was a powerful force on itself. Religion in, 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 for the Jews for most of the last hundreds of years was a family, a community issue. They couldn't do anything by force usually against, uh, they didn't have an army, they didn't have a law on their side. So the fight is also usually a bit more about the person, about the community, about, you know, you're leaving the ultra orthodox community here, but you're still part of a community because right. Jews behave as a community. It's, it's a, it has a very different flavor. Right. And even atheists here are sort of a bit more like a community than I think atheists around the world. But the way, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, let me know, this is how I think about it. I also went to Palestine just uh, yesterday and I met the atheist community there. And this is a very surprisingly strong atheist community in, pa in Palestine. I just think uh, Israel, um, in Israel, the atheist community growing and com showing the atheist community around the world that they're growing and the Palestinian atheist community growing and showing that they're growing. Showing that to the rest of the world, uh, will inspire a lot of hope for atheists around the world because if, if it's growing in Israel and Palestine, how could it not be growing anywhere else. Else, everywhere else? So, yeah. So, first of all, I have uh, uh, about two years ago, uh, a friend of mine connected me with uh, some, someone from East Jerusalem 
uh, who's an atheist, and, and he, was, he wanted to create an atheist community here in East Jerusalem, right. and someone told him about me, so he wanted to see if we can work together, or, or, uh, or at least I can advise him. Um, he ended up just leaving to Berlin or something. He decided that, you know, it's too fucked up everything here. I don't have <laughs> patience for it, but I can't blame him. Uh, it's also... It's, it's way harder for him because he said some of his friends really have, uh, 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 they fear for them life, for the life. I mean, they say like some, you, you can have even one crazy family member mm. and that's enough to fear for your life where in Jews it's very rare where, you know, someone will actually kill you. You know, they'll, they'll isolate you, whatever. It's a lot of bad things, but they won't kill you. So he was more frightened here so he decided to leave but yeah I, I always think about it, like if, if if I meet a, 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 a Palestinian atheist like how much argument can we have so obviously you know I might be even if I, I was like really right-wing and I would say I want a country for my own but like why should I care that he has a country and I like what 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 yeah, obviously, I'm not saying like every war in history was was started as a as a religious war but like I think if you would take religion out of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, um, uh, argument, that would make things so much simpler. It wouldn't solve it, but it makes it easier. Yeah, because then it's just you know, like a territory and whatever. Right. Yeah, obviously, I mean, he wants to live yeah. here. I want to. Live. I mean, yeah, it's not I always, that easy. Every time we say like when, when we're fighting religion, people tell us like, "Oh, do you think all the world's problems are going to be solved with that religion?" And like we never said that. We just think it would be a, a lot better. Some of them, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't need to solve it. <laughs> I was in I was in uh, in Pennsylvania a few years ago. I, I visited my uh, brother. He lives in the states, and I with my mother, uh, and and we traveled with him to Amishland. And and while we were traveling, you know, I, I, uh, my brother is driving, and I'm reading, you know, in Wikipedia about the Amish. And 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 again, it's like they have something like they they barely have any reports about violence. All the reports they do have about violence are, are religious related that, you know, they fought between them because they, they decided that some of the families are not religious enough. And we're like, it's, it's like reading about our community. It was so funny to, 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 to see it. Like it's, so again, it's not like, you know, Amish have probably positive things and negative things. Ultra-Orthodox Jews, even though I really strongly disagree with them, have some positive things. But you see there's so many similarities in the negative things these communities have you must admit there's something that has to do with but really. It's not just yeah. coincidental. I, I, we have to go, but I have. To, I really have to ask. This is what our last question, so I'm going to ask that. Um, one one problem when it comes to joining, you know, showing solidarity with atheists in Israel and trying to, uh, you know, you know, work with them and help them out. It seems like, especially for atheists outside of Israel, criticizing Judaism as a religion. Um, we get attacked a lot when we do that. Uh, we, we're called anti-Semitic and we told them like, this is not the religion, you know, to attack because, and I, and I just don't know if that's, if that's fair because we're not talking about ethnicity, but like they say, it doesn't matter if you're not talking about ethnicity. Uh, if you attack Judaism, you're helping the- Other you're, anti-Semitism. You're basically feeding their narratives. So. so. So first of all, Judaism is unique. It, it, for, for many, many years, it was both a religion and a nationality. Now it became even more complicated. Now it's a religion, a nationality, and a country. Right. So now you have the same thing with uh, left-wing people attacking Israel for what it does to the Palestinians and people calling it anti-Semitic because they, even though you know, they claim, no, we're just arguing with you know, the way you behave in this um, um, territorial uh, uh, fight, but they say, yeah, but you're feeding, you know, anti-Semitic um, um, uh, notions. Maybe even sometimes, you know, your basic idea is, is, is natural and, and, and logical, but you have some anti-Semitic tones in it. Mm. Um, look, there's Jews, there's Judaism, and there's Israel, and they have a lot to do with each other, but they're not exactly the same thing. Um, um, it's the same way there's some great uh, Holocaust jokes, but they only belong to us. No one else is allowed to do them. You know, I'm okay if most of the attacks against Judaism will come from atheist Jews mm. and, and the rest of the atheists will focus on atheism and in general are not focused because, not because I think it comes from a point of, of anti-Semitism, but if some people fear 
it will cause anti-Semitism, so maybe don't do it. And more than that, why give them, why give people that argue with you this, this, this chance to have this claim? So just, focus. I mean, I'm not saying they're correct, but I'm saying they have a point that you just have to spend energy in arguing with them. So just, you know, drop it. My, my, my counter to that is that, you know, the, 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 the fact is that these things in the Tormor or uh, Talmud are obviously wrong, right? And um, we're not saying anything that is, you know, I mean, within our atheist community is controversial. It's, it's very obvious to us that it's wrong. The thing is that if we, if we don't point out to the obvious, that we're actually giving the people that want to use the truth to sell their narrative of hate, we're giving them the monopoly over pointing out some truth. We, Definitely. Right. You, you, you said uh, uh, arguing or attacking. When it is about pointing out right and wrong, pointing out fallacies, that you should do to anyone. And it can be the, the it, it can be, I know, blacks or women or any kind of minority or any kind of group. If the, if the transgender community was wrong in something, you should point it out yet, even though there are a ton of people who hate transgenders and, and will use this in order to attack them. If someone is wrong, you always have to point out it's but wrong. But pointing out the harm of religion is my definition of attacking religion. If, so, okay. Pointing out religion is wrong, or what is wrong in some religion, is always correct. Uh, pointing out religion is harmful should be done maybe a bit differently to Judaism because Judaism didn't have the chance to be harmful for a very long time. I'm not saying Judaism didn't want to be harmful. I'm not saying when Jews had the chance they weren't harmful. But Judaism for 2,000 years barely had the opportunity to save itself. So right. they didn't have a chance to harm too many other people. By the way, 70 years now, they're doing a quite good job in starting to I mean, harm people. I mean, your life experience is, is an, an exa example. Yeah, but yeah, uh, Judaism should be treated differently, not because, oh, Jews went through terrible things, but because Jews really had a different operating system of religion for 2,000 years. And yes, some of the things happening now, when you see what, what uh, ultra-Orthodox people do now in some places, I don't know if you know, uh, about a few weeks ago, there was an event where women that want to pray in the, near the uh, Wailing Whale. Right. And, and they are, some of them are reforms, which for ultra-Orthodox people is terrible. Other of them are even Orthodox, but they believe that women are allowed to do a few more things, like reading the Torah or things like that, and they hit them. They, you know, religion is causing people to hit women. That's definitely something you can point out. That's definitely something you can talk against. And I don't care how many anti-Semitists will want to use it. How about just for bringing attention to Judaism as a wrong ideology by just amplifying the voices of atheist Jews? Like, would that be... That's, that's definitely correct, both because they say... It's, it, for the same reason I like Jerusalem, because... You have extreme right and extreme left wing here, but they're sort of a bit more realistic. You can, you know, if you live in an isolated community where you never saw an Arab, so you can think that all Arabs are great and no one is doing terribly, anything terrible, or all Arabs are terrible and, and everyone wants to kill us, and, and you won't see anything that contradicts your belief. You live in Jerusalem, you saw, you know, a place where uh, some Palestinian committed some kind of, of, of a terror attack, and, and, and you know that your friend was saved because another Palestinian was actually the paramedic who came to save him. So you, you all, you're already balanced a little bit, even if your opinion are, are relatively extreme, you saw both sides. So the same way I think uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish atheists usually see the complexity in Judaism where, I mean, they don't believe, they're atheists, that's, so, that's clear, but they see where you should attack or, or speak against Judaism in a slightly different manner than you can speak about religion as a whole or other religions. So that's maybe the difference I would point out. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you I wish I had more idea. time, but this was amazing. Thank My you pleasure. So much. Thank you. Bye. Atheists are under attack in many places. If they were Christians, their voices would be heard. If they were Jews, their voices would be heard. If they were Muslims, their voices would be heard. But they are atheists, and not many seem to be listening. Let's make it difficult for them to ignore us. We have built a global community, and now we are tearing down geographic, cultural, and language barriers so we can find each other and support each other. In the last decade, we have built the largest atheist community in the world. 
Now we're doing the same in other languages. With your help, we have started Atheist Republic in Persian and Arabic. انضميت مؤخرا لأسرة Atheist Republic وحيصير عندي بودكاست باللغة العربية. As we grow, we can dedicate more time, staff, and resources to start doing the same in Spanish, Portuguese, Malay, Bengali, Urdu, Hindi, and other languages. We are providing community, support, informative content, and amplifying the voices of those who need protection, especially in countries where people feel isolated simply for their lack of belief. We want to be there for them, and we are only getting started. Help us get there. Check in the description for ways you can support our projects. Thank you.